bundle, um, a supplementary bundle, and an authority bundle. We do, and we've also received very helpful skeleton arguments from both sides, replacement skeleton arguments, and we've read the material. Thank you. This is an appeal against the decision of Mrs. Justice Joanna Smith and Judge Jonathan Canaan sitting in the Upper Tribunal. It concerns a critical question of when and how the statutory defence, known as a reasonable excuse, is established. At its heart is the question identified by my lady, Lady Justice Whipple, in the um, order for permission that appears at page four of the core bundle behind tab one. In summary, the critical question is whether having only one option of proceeding with judicial review and running the risk, at least, that he would render those proceedings nugatory, whether a reasonable excuse can be made out without the need for subjective evidence. This is an important case on a number of levels. Firstly, it concerns reasonable excuse, a matter which takes up a lot of time in the SPP. Secondly, and more importantly, it's a case about access to justice. HMRC issued a closure notice without an amendment to Mr Archer's self-assessment and did not send tax calculations. They made a mistake. They did not follow their own procedures, procedures designed to ensure statutory compliance. As such, there was a legitimate question whether mis the mistake carried the consequences that they were precluded from collecting the tax, which lay at the heart of the mistake. Mr Archer simply sought to establish, through the judicial review proceedings, whether there was an enforceable debt. Paying the debt even under process would, or certainly at least could, have excluded him from obtaining an answer to that question or at least an answer from which he could benefit. In my submissions, I will firstly provide an overview of how we arrived before this court, then review the relevant legislation and case law on reasonable excuse, demonstrate by reference to the approach taken by the upper tribunal how it fell into error, thereby inviting the court to again remake the decision as to whether on the evidence available a reasonable excuse is established. Identify the evidence that proves the reasonable excuse asserted and show that viewed objectively a reasonable excuse is made out for the full period and to be core that payment was made within a reasonable period after the reasonable excuse ceased. In this part of my submission, I will consider individually and ultimately collectively the three components of the reasonable excuse which was actually asserted. Those three components are that there is a strong prima facie case that there was no debt, the interim relief orders and subsequent agreement with HMRC and Mr Archer permitted a reasonable expectation that payment need not be made while the litigation was ongoing, and thirdly, that there was a real risk that the ability to ask the court to determine whether or not there was a debt would have been lost or rendered ineffective had payment been made before the actual conclusion of that litigation. Finally, and noting my Lady Lady Justice Whipple's comments um, in the permission application, I will very lightly touch on ground three, which concerns the postponement mechanism on any hypothetical appeal to the SPT. On the 10th of May 2016, HMRC issued two automatic that, um, surcharge notices for non-payment of tax for the tax years ended 5th of April 2002 and 5th of April 2003. For my lady's note, those are and core bundles, tabs 12A and B. Two further surcharge notices were issued on the 8th of February 2019 for the same tax, which, was remain which had remained unpaid for more than six months, and those are at tabs 12C and D of the core bundle. The surcharges related to the tax which was said to be due consequent upon conclusions stated in closure notices issued on the 2nd of February 2016. Those are supplementary bundles one and two and I will come to those shortly. As the court will be aware from the judgments below and the skeleton arguments, 
the question of whether those closure notices actually resulted in an amount due to HMRC at all at that time in 2016 was in dispute. Not on substantive grounds, but on the basis of a serious procedural error in both closure notices, namely that they simply omitted to amend the taxpayer self-assessment. It is relevant to note at this stage that Mr Archer had received APNs during the course of HMRC's inquiry into those two tax years in respect of certain tax largely corresponding to the, clo the conclusions in the closure notices. The co we can short circuit this, can't we? The closure notices um, it indicated that the, re the loss relief claims were not accepted. So there was a technical failure, technical defect in the closure notices, wasn't there? there was. Because uh, all the conclusions were stated, but there wasn't an amendment that said, you now owe X. It, you could work out what X was very easily because the loss relief claims were, were rejected and Mr Archer could have worked out exactly what he owed, but, but legally the closure notices needed to amend the uh, self-assessment. It was a technical uh, error. That is correct, my lady. Yeah. The point I was trying to make is that although he had received APNs, those APNs w did not crystallise a liability to tax. So this was not a question of the APNs crystallising a liability to tax. So there was no APN crystallisation. And so the debate was whether there was a liability crystallised on the closure notice. The closure notice would have been the self-assessment. Would, would have, have been, been the assessment. Would could have amended the self-assessment, but and would not. have been the assessment had it done so. That is correct. There was a technical failure that was put right by section one one four, and therefore the debt is treated as always having been created by the closure notice. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> the surcharge notices are issued pursuant to section fifty nine C which provides that a taxpayer is liable to pay a first surcharge where any income tax which has become payable remains unpaid after 28 days, and, and then a second surcharge is liable um, is due where tax remains unpaid for six months. That is unless a reasonable excuse is established throughout the period. By virtue of section 1182, the effect of a reasonable excuse and or a reasonable delay after a reasonable excuse has ended is that there is no relevant default at all. Mr Archer appealed the surcharge notices on the basis he had a reasonable excuse for non-payment of the tax in question. Um, by the time it was heard by the FTT, the reasonable excuse advanced was that for the full period he was entitled to rely on the fact that he was litigating a, a case before the High Court, which was going to establish whether the tax was due at all. And in all of the circumstances, it would have been unreasonable for enforcement to take place or for him to have actually paid the tax while he was questioning that issue. At all times, Mr Archer had the funds to make payments. And once it was definitively determined... Where's the evidence of that? There are no findings that he had the funds because he didn't give any evidence, did he? The, before the... Um, he, he produced a witness statement. In the uh, bankruptcy JR. In the bankruptcy JR. Yeah. In which he stated that he had the funds. At that point, yes. At that point, yeah. Um, and that was accepted by Mr Justice Carr. Mr Justice Carr accepted that well, he had the funds. Yeah, well, for the purposes of an interim relief application. Agreed. Yeah. But that's it. That was the point. That, that, that was at a point in time. He never thereafter gave evidence to say that he still had the funds available and that they weren't in, tied up in some investment that was producing greater returns than... Uh, than um, he otherwise would have uh, received had he uh, had the money been paid over to the revenues. We also have the fact that um, the Supreme Court, nobody has any 
prior warning that this was going to happen, the Supreme Court issued its um, decision on permission on the 14th of June, and he immediately paid it. So yes, but he knew he'd lost in the Court of Appeal, and he was waiting for, for permission in the Supreme Court. So he had time from the moment he lost in the Court of Appeal to liquidate those funds if they were tied up. We just don't know because he didn't put any in any evidence. That's right. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Mr. Archer did not provide a witness statement or give oral evidence in um, this in his appeal to the FTT. Rather, he relied on what um, should, in our view, be considered to be far better evidence, the clear and unequivocal evidence contained in the judgments and orders of the court and other contemporaneous documents pertaining to the litigation, including the account statements sent to him by HMRC. Judge Bowler, sitting in the FTT, determined that no reasonable excuse was made out. She did so, at least in part, labouring under the misapprehension that in order to challenge whether the closure notice established an enforceable debt, Mr Archer should have made an appeal to the FTT against the closure notices. In connection with, in her view, um, he would have been required to make payment in order to bring that appeal. She concluded that he was sidestepping the process that was available to him to avoid payment um, and that's picking up the wording used by HMRC in their um, application to the or their notice of objection to the Supreme Court. As accepted by the UT, in reaching her conclusion in that regard, Judge Bowler made two errors. Firstly, considering that Mr. Archer should have appealed to the FTT, and secondly, that on an appeal he would have been required to pay. Actually, there was a third error of Judge Bowler which was then perpetuated by the upper tribunal, which concerned the question of postponement. And I will discuss that as briefly as possible in ground three. The UT set aside the FTT's judgment in exercise of its jurisdiction under section 12 of the Tribunal Court Enforcement Act and remade the decision. The UT confirmed the ultimate conclusion that Mr. Archer had not established a reasonable excuse. Mr. Archer contends that in doing so, the UT itself erred in law, firstly in applying the wrong test, and secondly in failing to recognise that on the evidence and by reference to all circumstances, no reasonable taxpayer would have made or been expected to have made payment before the conclusion of the judicial review. Moving on to the relevant legislation and case law. The relevant legislation is um, Section 53C, which is in Authorities, Tab 8, 20, um, page 29. Sorry about 25, I can't read my own writing. Yeah, Section 59C. This provision um, provides, as I've already said, for the imposition of surcharges in um, certain specific situations where money is outstanding, um, there is a, a debt has arisen and um, payment has not been made within 28 days, within six months, and then subject to the um, provision of being excused from a surcharge in relation to a reasonable excuse. Section 118, which is at tab 11 of the authorities bundle, 1182, um, page 36, provides that a person should be deemed to have not have failed to do anything if permitted to do so by HMRC, um, and where there is a reasonable excuse, then the um, reason, but payment is made within a reasonable time or not within an unreasonable time after the reasonable excuse has ended. As this court will be aware, the reasonable excuse defence is not exclusive to the late payment surcharge regime in section 59. 
It's a defence generally provided by the legislation in respect of a range of compliance failures across a number of um, different taxes. Reasonable excuse is not defined by statute. However, there is, um, it, it's for the, the court or tribunal to consider the perfect particular circumstances of the individual case um, and determine whether the conduct of the taxpayer in question is reasonable. The relevant statutes also sometimes prescribe limits on what can amount to reasonable excuse, um, as is apparent in the context of surcharges for late payment, an insufficiency of funds does not amount to a reasonable excuse. In some other contexts, reliance on a third party is also excluded. It's inability to pay, not insufficiency of funds, isn't it? Yes. For surcharges. Isn't it subsection 10? I've got that wrong. I apologise, I may be wrong. In other situations, it's insufficiency yeah, but of here funds. it's inability to pay, for whatever reason. I propose to deal with the limited number of authorities chronologically rather than by theme. So the first chronologically is Steptoe, which is at tab 21 of the authorities bundle, page 138. Stepto is a reasonable excuse case concerning default surcharges issued for late filing and payment of VAT returns. Stepto has repeatedly had repeatedly rendered and paid back returns late and offered as a reasonable excuse defence the fact that their principal customer, Bedbridge Council, was a persistent late payer. Under the relevant default surcharge regime, um, insufficiency of funds was excluded from representing a reasonable excuse. We see a page 148 at 8 that um, Lord Justice Nolan, by reference to his own judgment in Salivan, noted that a reasonable excuse defence gave HMRC and the tribunal a wide discretion to alleviate the impact of the default surcharge regime, which imposed a strict and fixed penalty for default. As such, he considered that its application should not be cut down to any greater extent than is strictly required by the statutory provisions excluding insufficiency of funds and reliance on third parties. HMRC's challenge in that case was that only the direct cause of the fault um, was relevant. We see that at 149 at A. That was rejected by um, Lord Justice Nolan in preference of an approach which reflected the context of the scheme for collection of VAT. Thus, where a trader operated the cash accounting scheme and had thereby collected VAT borne by the customer before incurring a liability to HMRC, insufficiency of funds could not be a reasonable excuse for non-payment. Where, however, the taxpayer was effectively having to self-fund the VAT due to um, him from his customer, because in essence his liability to HMRC arose before he had been paid by his customer, it was necessary and appropriate to look behind the direct cause of the insufficiency of funds. And we see that from D to E and at H by reference to Salivan. What are you on page 149? I am. Thank you, my lady. So D to E. So D to E. and B from whether in any video 
Lord Justice Donaldson sets out his own interpretation of Lord Justice Nolan's view in establishing that there is there may still be a reasonable excuse for non-payment, which is directly caused by an insufficiency of funds. In his view, reasonable excuse for default is established where the exercise of reasonable foresight and of due diligence and a proper regard for the fact that the tax would become due on a particular date would not have avoided the insufficiency of funds. And we see that at page one or oh, sorry, one five one of the um, printout, um, just above D down to F. There's a reference in the first bullet you took us to on page 148, a quote there, to this being a discretion. I'm not sure um, it is a discretion. It's, it's more an ev I think it's discussed in Perrin. It's an evaluative judgment that the tribunal or court has to reach. I, I would agree. The way, I think it's the way we phrase it these days, anyway. Certainly, that's, that's the way it's evolved. Yeah. So as I read this case, it's getting round the statutory prohibition on looking at insufficiency of funds as a reasonable excuse. It's saying you can look behind at why there's an insufficiency of funds. Um, is this a case that is relevant on the, the issue of causation? Well, HMRC say yes. Um, I say it's broader than that. As I've already submitted, what the court is looking at is, um, as Lord Nolan said, it, it, he didn't want the statutory pro prohibition on insufficiency to curtail unnecessarily this broader perspective about alleviating where it is right that somebody should be alleviated from these fixed and strict penalties. So we say the significance of the judgment of this appeal is it shows the court preserving its ability to decide what does and does not constitute a reasonable excuse in a flexible and case-specific manner, in a case where it was equitable and just that that taxpayer paid late, even in the context of a statutory prohibition that presented and said, you're out. Mm. The next um, case chronologically on reasonable excuse is um, the case of um, Francis It's important to, sorry, that's um, tab 25, starting at page 306. It's important to note that um, the Chapman case concerned APN penalties. As the court will be aware, the effect of an APN is to accelerate the date on which tax becomes payable, pursuant to section 2235 of the Finance Act 2014, tax becomes payable immediately on the expiry of 90 days after the issue of the APN, or where statutory representations are made within 30 days of the determination 
of those representations and the associated confirmation of the APN. There's no statutory right of appeal against the issue of an APN. Representations may be made, but once confirmed, the only right of challenge is by way of judicial review. There is, however, a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal against a penalty charged for late payment of an APN, principally on the question of whether the circumstances of the issue of the penalty were met, and if so, whether the appellant had a reasonable excuse. Mr Chapman had fought judicial review proceedings and had been granted interim relief on the grounds that payment would cause him hardship. HMRC were prevented from enforcing the APN, but on terms which expressly provided that they may continue to penalise for non-payment. The reasonable excuse says offered for non-payment by Mr Chapman were threefold, and we see them at page 316 of the bundle at paragraph 61 to 63. His first reasonable excuse was that he'd had difficulties communicating with HMRC. His second reasonable excuse was a lack of liquidity, and his third was that on the basis of reputable advice, he believed the APN to be invalid, such that it was not reasonable to pay it. The tribunal swiftly dismissed bases one and two, and then focused on the third. At paragraph 72, which is over the page, the FTT considered there to be a general presumption of lawfulness, but that in the case of a gross and obvious failure in the APN itself, a reasonable excuse based on a belief of unlawfulness may be established. When evaluating the belief that the notice was lawful, the tribunal was concerned to determine the reasonableness of the belief. And at 73, the tribunal identifies that a reasonable excuse may be established where it was apparent that it was very likely that the notice was unlawful. And at 74, recognising that for such a belief to be reasonable, it must be robustly based. And I'll leave the tribunal to the court to briefly read 72 to 74. I just noted 75. It makes the point again that the interim relief provided for penalties to be issued. The next case I'd like to take the court to is... Just before you do, sorry, Judge Hellier... Just give me one moment. Yes, 59 on page 316. I just wondered if you agreed with what Judge Hellier says there, that for something to be an excuse, it must be such that absent that thing, payment would have been made. Kind of, is the answer. We say that, yes, there must be a... The reasonable excuse must be established. But what we say is you don't need subjective evidence to say it was this. And I'll come on to discuss that. Well, there's a difference, isn't there, between subjective evidence about what the reasonable excuse is, and you say here, I think, but tell me if I'm wrong, that the fact that courts gave permission 
to apply for judicial review and granted interim relief to support uh, those proceedings was enough objective evidence in itself and didn't need uh, a witness statement from Mr. Archer saying, I was advised I had a judicial review claim and I should pursue it. I would hate to say you were wrong, but I actually agree as well. But you do agree, <laughs> all right. But then there's a separate question of whether it is the fact that there was this uh, procedural challenge in the judicial review to the closure notice that was the reason for not paying. And on that, only the taxpayer knows what his or her reasons are. And unless the taxpayer gives evidence about what those reasons are, or at least excludes the possibility that there were other reasons operating, um, that that is about the subjective evidence, isn't it? With respect, I do disagree yeah. with that. I thought you might. <laughs> Our position is that it is objectively obvious what the cause was because of the nature of the proceedings he was taking. Well, before we, before we come to what happened in this particular case, what, what about the principle? Are you, you, are you saying it's always an objective question or do you accept that there will be cases where the taxpayer must give evidence? Uh, I completely accept that there will be cases where taxpayers have to give evidence. Right, so you, you do agree that it's not just a question of what the excuse is, but it's about whether that excuse was the reason for or the thing that explained the non-payment. A reason. So if, if there are two reasonable excuses, and they're both permissible, reasonable excuses. The court doesn't well, need doesn't to decide matter. which one. Yeah. Where there's a permissible, reasonable excuse and an impermissible, reasonable excuse, the court's got to decide whether it was the permissible one or the impermissible one. But this isn't an excavation exercise of going round and looking at all possible reasonable excuses and eliminating them. Um, as the court will no doubt be aware, I'm an FTT judge. We deal with reasonable excuses quite quickly. Um, and the, the thought of having to eliminate every ev everything else before determining whether this one was reasonable would be just completely unworkable. Well, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? The taxpayer says this was the reason. Not always. Not always. Because? I mean, because it may it not be believed, but what, what's hard about saying this is the reason? Well, it's, it's what is the postulated reasonable excuse? Yes. And how is that postu postulated reasonable excuse um, proven? So if my, if my lady's question was, it's what the taxpayer says, in terms of pleadings, that's absolutely right. It's what is the asserted reasonable excuse? But there is a difference between the asserted reasonable excuse and the evaluation of the asserted reasonable excuse and whether there has to be oral evidence. So uh, I th I, what is the asserted reasonable excuse and how is that proven? That's one question. But was that reasonable excuse the thing, the reason why payment wasn't made? That's a second question. And that's really the question I'm exploring. So it, it, it is a second question. Do you, you accept that? I accept that. But I say that it's only a relevant question where there is evidence that there is an inexcusable reason. So it's only relevant to exclude reasons that wouldn't amount to reasonable excuses? As long as you've got a reasonable excuse. So you look at a reasonable excuse, you say, yep, I think that's reasonable. If there is nothing to indicate that there is an inexcusable reason, the causative exercise is not actually a separate question that's been incorporated. It's 1A and 1B, not 1A. 
have a reasonable excuse, it runs until it ends. And that reasonable ex it's justifiable to conclude that that reasonable excuse is the reason that you didn't pay, unless there's evidence to indicate that an inexcusable reason was also in the mix. Well, what do you mean by evidence? Objectively verified circumstances. But, but who, how, it, it's for the taxpayer to prove his or her case on reasonable excuse. The taxpayer knows what's going on, the revenue knows very little about what's going on except what the taxpayer tells them. What, what, I'm not sure what you mean by objectively verifiable evidence. I mean, just taking this case as an example, it's quite possible, and I'm not suggesting this is the case, but it is quite possible that uh, Mr. Um, uh, Archer took a, a, a financial and business-like decision uh, that, that there was a, 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 um, a, good, a good rate of return to be had on investing the 22 million odd tax um, rather than paying it over to the revenue. And he had some advice that said he had a jolly good uh, challenge um, to the closure notice. It might not ultimately win, um, but it could take years to resolve. Uh, and he took a business-like decision that he'd rather take the risk and invest the money and have the interest on the money or the interest on the investment. Now, uh, one of the, it, the the judicial review may be a very good, reasonable excuse, but it wasn't necessarily the reason. The reason was he wanted to get a better return on the money in the meantime and defer payment of the tax. But who, who? And who puts forward the evidence uh, about the possibility of that other excuse, only for it to be um, disregarded on your case? All of these cases are fact specific. Yes. Our position in this case is he could not pay because this judicial review to establish whether there was a debt or not would simply have fallen over. Everything else is irrelevant. It's, it's like if there's a roadblock, it doesn't matter why else you might follow the diversion. You can't go down that road because there's a roadblock. Are, are you saying that a permissible reason suffices even though there might be an impermissible reason as well. Is that, I'm not sure. I think we're mixing well, up two things. Mm. Before you were saying we were talking about uh, is it either a permissible reason or an impermissible reason? But you could have situations where there are there is more than one reason at play. But if there's more than one permissible reason. No, no. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question because if it's if it's permissible and permissible, that why matter. does it matter? But that's not what we're talking about, yeah. is it? We're talking about there may be two reasons operating: a permissible one and an impermissible one. So let's take the scenario that my lady says there is a there is another investment that might be a very uh, that Mr. Archer might have been interested in to postulate a marriage. He's also let's just say for the sake of argument. Uh, been advised that uh, it would at the least complicate his JR claim if he paid the tax. We we don't we just don't know what what uh, what. So what do you say about that? Do you say the fact that he because I thought you were saying the fact that he's had or may have had let's assume he had advice that uh, his JR claim would be potentially jeopardised if he paid the tax is sufficient. We say that it's a question, it, the, the, the advice is irrelevant in this case. If the advice was relevant, Mr Archer could, should, would have given evidence on the advice. We say that it was objectively clear that he could not pay 
because he would bring to end, an end his judicial review. If the question put to me is, well, he had 22, 24 million pounds, it was sitting around, he put it on a deposit, that wasn't an inability to pay. It wasn't even an unwillingness to pay. He could not pay. If the £24 million is on a deposit, he can still get it off. Well, but let's, let's hypothesise a, an investment that required it to be tied up for two years. There is... Working on a hypothesis and clearly not giving evidence. No. There is nothing that stops the withdrawal of money from anywhere. There may be penalty clauses. But it, he may have made a business decision that it was better to pay the revenues penalty clause than the financial houses. Or, you know, what we just don't know. That's what we're just exploring with you. How how is one to decide in these circumstances where there is a permissible reason and an impermissible reason. With respect, my lady, that assumes that you have concluded that his business decision was an impermissible one. Well, are you saying that it would be a permissible, a reasonable excuse to decide that you want to invest the money in a business proposition rather than pay it to the revenue? Not in isolation, no. Well, when but can it ever be? In the context of not being able to pay, it's not being able to pay because it would bring your judicial review proceedings to an end, it isn't actually, you, you've, sorry to go back to my roadblock, you've got a roadblock and you've got to, you've got to follow a diversion. In following that diversion, you may choose to put the money on deposit, but it's, it's secondary and ancillary. It's parasitic on the first, which is that if you'd have made payment, you would have brought your proceedings to an end and rendered it impossible to, or at least a very high degree of risk, that rendered it impossible to, to ever be right other than in a pyrrhic sense. So you're saying on the facts of this case it doesn't matter. But, but and I was really just trying to explore the principle. You, I think you're conceding that there may be cases where, but tell me if I'm wrong, where a permissible reason and an impermissible reason may require resolution by the tribunal. And if that is the case, the only person who can give evidence about it is the taxpayer. And he may not particularly want to go into the witness box and give evidence of his own, but he, and, he, and he may be able to get evidence from elsewhere. I'm not ruling out that possibility, but it may be necessary for him to go into the witness box and give evidence about what it was that led to him not paying and what so, was the, the, the reason that operated predominantly. So certainly in the case of a permissible and an impermissible, yeah. statute, statutorily impermissible, I would concede that you would almost inevitably, I might even go as far as inevitably, have to have evidence right. of, of that. Where you... I think my lady's question is slightly more nuanced than that, and I think you were asking where if there is another reason that's not prohibited by statute, but which the court or tribunal might think is an impermissible one. Yeah. Or, or, or not impermissible. Not reasonable. But not, not, reasonable. Not, not, not good enough. Not reasonable. <laughs> so yeah. reasonable excuse would not be established on this explanation, yes. but it would be established on that explanation. Yes. My headline is, that's not this case. Um, I think I would be forced to concede that if it is a postulated one... What do you mean postulated? So uh, it's 
So the taxpayers, as we saw from in, in Chapman, he advanced three reasons. Well, well, he didn't advance the second one. Did he? Perhaps he did. Yes, he did. He did. Okay. Well, but it says no such events or other reasons for lack of funds appeared from the evidence. Oh, sorry, that's outside the taxpayer's control. He did advance it. Yeah, so, yeah. so he, That's a statutorily uh, impermissible reason. But he also had a first reason, yeah. which was I had bad communications with HMRC. Yeah. Now, what Judge Hellier said was, that's not good enough, yeah. one. Number two, you haven't met the test. Yep. Let's look at number three. Now... What is apparent is that he was prepared to consider three to see whether it was reasonable. We'll never know what Judge Hellier would have done if he'd have found that three was reasonable in the context of having one yeah. that wasn't and two that certainly wasn't. Neither one, n neither the failure on one or two was a strikeout to considering Mr Chapman's reasonable excuse. But, but there had to be a resolution of the question. Which were well, not in Chapman because they were all unreasonable. Yes. But that's because the judge decided they were unreasonable. So there was an examination of the reasonableness of those excuses think Mr Chapman gave evidence and the judge decided that they weren't reasonable. He might have had to go on to consider whether they were operative um, as well but that didn't arise. No. And really my question is are, are you accepting that where there are where there are the are open to a tribunal reasonable and potentially unreasonable excuses taxpayer may have to give evidence about that. There must be evidence given. I, so as, as my lady said, there, might, there could be all forms of how that evidence is given. Yeah. But yes. Because, Mrs Brown, can I pick this gun off a little bit more? Because um, the rival impermissible or not reasonable um, excuse may be one that HMRC simply wants to put to the so that the FTC can make its mind up about whether it was there or not. I mean, there may not be, so for example, the investment proposition that my lady puts, you may not have any evidence in terms of documentary evidence or anybody submitting to that, but that may be what HMRC suspects, and the only way they can get evidence into the FTC about it is to cross-examine on it. If there is I struggle to a degree as as to how much you've got to do to not prove something that you don't say. Well, don't we still? Uh, I don't want to enter into debate with you, but isn't the issue the FTC in the first place has got to decide whether a reasonable excuse is made out by the taxpayer? And, and that's where you, that's where you begin and end, isn't it? And if a reasonable excuse mm. is clearly made out by the taxpayer, the extent to which other possibilities need to ex be explored will, to a large degree, depend on the strength of the reasonable excuse that is accepted. Can I just circle back then to your case now, just to make sure that I've got a really clear focus, that you say that in this case, so back into these facts, um, there was a roadblock roadblock was the JR proceedings because you couldn't pay the tax and pursue the JR or at least you, you would jeopardise the JR. Do you say that that, that operates um, as a matter of law to conclude the issue on reasonable excuse or is it that the FTT you say should have drawn an inference that that was a reasonable excuse because there wasn't really any room for anything else? So in this case we say it operates as a matter of law because the Court of Appeal, this court, has already said so. 
That's the Lewis and Judge one. That bit. Yes. Yeah. So the we'll come to it. Lewis and said, sorry, Lord Justice. Sorry, yes, you're right. Said, um, it's all right for you to call him that. <laughs> it's not actually. I shouldn't have done it. It's I'm not very sorry. I'll ignore what you did. Um, there was no amendment. That was wrong. It was remediated. Mr. Archer, in his own interest, could not have been compelled to go to the SEC. Um, there was a JR route or a bankruptcy court route, but the bankruptcy court route led to the very prejudice that he was trying to avoid. So we, we have everything we need to show what we want to show, is what we say. In this case, so although this is a really important case in, um, in context, because it's, it's such a litigated area, the facts of this case are pretty few and pretty rare. I mean, as I will come on to, there was evidence that HMRC, Heather Buse from KPMG said, I've never seen a closing interest like this. Mrs. Cook said, our guidance doesn't provide for a closure notice like this. And Mr. Justice Jay found that it was in HMRC's almost invariable practice to not issue these. You know, normally you see, this is my reason, this is my conclusion, this is what it means, pound note, dot, dot, dot. That bit was missing, and it was obviously missing. Um, so in this case, as a matter of law, the points were proven, and we say that is the best evidence we could possibly have to support a conclusion for reasonably equivalent. As a matter of causation as well. So you, yes. we're picking away. We're, we're effectively saying there, there are sort of two component bits here. There's, we'll talk perhaps about where the tribunal goes, talking about um, evidence against subjective belief. You may want to address us on that. But another bit we've been looking at is this evidence about causation. But you say that. Um, Court of Appeals ruling as a matter of law, your case is as a matter of law, it determines the reasonableness of the excuse effectively in your view. I do. So the next case is um, Herring, um, tab 26, starting at page 322. This is, um, and has since 2018, been every FTT judge's written Bible for um, reasonably excused cases. It concerned a late filing penalty. Um, Mrs. Perrin had completed her tax return online. She printed a copy, a copy in, of the received submission receipt, but didn't complete the final step in the submission process. It does boggle your mind slightly that you can get a submission receipt without actually having to, but there it is. Um, the facts are set out in the head note, and Mrs. Perrin um, claimed to have a reasonable excuse on the basis that she believed that she had submitted her return. Before providing the seminal um, summary test at paragraph 81, at um, paragraphs 52, 50 to 52, are at pages 336. Um, at 336, the um, Judge Berner explores the clean car company test. And in particular, the clean car company test was, was what the taxpayer did a reasonable thing for a responsible trader conscious of and intending to comply with his obligations regarding tax, but having the experience and other relevant attributes of the taxpayer, placed in a situation the taxpayer found himself at the relevant time a reasonable thing to do. Put another way, it's all the same quote, practically with no um, punctuation, put another way, 
was what the taxpayer did not an unreasonable thing for the, a trader of the sort I have envisaged in the position of the taxpayer? So there's a subjective test and it must be assessed objectively. Obje objective test assessed, um, assessed objectively, precisely. At paragraph 70 um, on page 341, Judge Berner says that... It's not Judge, Judge Harrington, I think. Yeah. Harrington and Cole. Harrington. Judge is Harrington and Cole. <laughs> Let me get these right. Um, identifies that the FTT must determine whether there are facts which objectively amount to reason that the is relevant or false. At 71, he emphasises that it's, um, it is the reasonable excuse actually advanced by the taxpayer which must be objectively reviewed by reference to all of the circumstances. And if I can invite the tribunal, oh, sorry, the court, I do apologise, um, to read paragraph 72. Can it? We say these paragraphs are significant because there's nothing to indicate that where the reasonable excuse relied on is not a state of mind, that a particular state of mind must be established at all. Paragraph 74 reinforces that a state of mind uh, will often be the sole or main fact on which a reasonable excuse is established. And then, the genuineness of that belief must be established. But if it's not a belief, you don't need any evidence of a state of mind. The court will be well aware of um, paragraph 81, and um, I invite you to read it if you're not in, in due course. It is set out in both our skeleton arguments for reference. Um, it provides a summary recognising that belief may be a factor in establishing a reasonable excuse, but the exercise to be undertaken is to assess the reasonable excuse offered by reference to the evidence, and then to determine whether together the facts found on the evidence objectively amount to an excuse for the relevant default. The tribunal had clearly endorsed clean car, um, and the Perrin test is actually no different. So you agree with 81, um, 1, 2, and 3? Yeah. Yeah. You just say it doesn't apply here. <coughs> the question is, is what was done a reasonable thing to be done by a taxpayer, generally, conscientious of and intending to comply with his tax obligations? Or does it... Do the, do the facts asserted amount to uh, a re uh, viewed objectively a reasonable excuse for the failure to pay the tax? We say that Mr. Archer wanted to ask the court whether he owed any money at all in the context of whether there was a debt. Conscious of time, 
I'm not going to take the court to drag it, which is my next one, the, the list. Um, it doesn't really add any more other than to, sh to reinforce that it's objectively looking at whether what the taxpayer did in all of the circumstances was reasonable, whether he exercised reasonable foresight and due diligence with a proper regard to his tax obligation. The next um, case is Sheeling at tab 28. This, like Chapman, is a, sorry, page um, 359. This, like Chapman, is a APN non-payment case. The reasonable excuse advanced was that on the basis of professional advice, the taxpayer believed that there was a good prospect of establishing that the APN was invalid by way of judicial review. The FTT accepted that the taxpayer had held that belief, that there were good prospects of success, um, despite changes in the law indicating that it might not be um, as strong. When considering whether and how a reasonable excuse would be established by reference to the perceived invalidity of an APN, the APN the UT drew a distinction between an asserted substantive in, in, invalidity and a procedural invalidity. This was in the particular context of the APN regime where the substantive tax issues are not litigable in the FTT. However, the tribunal accepted at um, 74 and 78, which are at page 376, that the statutory context of the APN regime does not preclude a belief as to procedural invalidity from representing a reasonable excuse. At paragraph 80, which I do apologise for not quite on, um, the UT emphasises that in the case of an APN, proceedings to challenge validity must have been begun in order to substantiate a reasonable excuse for non-payment on the basis of invalidity. At 81, which is a very long paragraph, so I'm going to invite you to read it later, um, in connection with the application of Perrin, the UT confirms that all the circumstances and evidence are to be taken into account, including um, the reason for the the alleged procedural invalidity by reference to Judge Hellier's categorisation of obvious and gross error. It's to be noted that the UT endorses that a slipped decimal point, I quote, in a statement of account to be paid and other similar procedural errors were gross and obvious so as to have the capacity to give rise to a reasonable excuse for non-payment of an APN, as I'll come to. We didn't have a statement, never mind a decimal point anywhere. The UT rejects at 83 the approach adopted by the FTT of demonstrating a high degree of confidence as to the invalidity, preferring the simple application of Perrin, consider the objective position. At 85, when confirming the result but not the reason, the UT reiterates that an obvious or gross error in an APN itself is likely to represent objective evidence of invalidity capable of establishing a reasonable excuse. But in Sheeling, there was no obvious or gross procedural error. The UT concluded that a reasonable, responsible taxpayer in all of the circumstances facing Mr Sheeling would have paid even though he was arguing um, the substantive position in judicial review. The UT was not prepared to interfere with the FTT's findings irrespective of the position regarding the belief in the strength of his case um, on the basis that there was also an insufficiency of funds. So here we had insufficiency of funds and not a permissible um, reasonable excuse in any event, so we're adjudicating between two nulls. 
Um, can we just, just, go, just <laughs> 86? Yeah. Well, I wanted to go to 80 and 81, actually, yeah. it seemed to me that uh, on a quick read of this case, with which you'll be much more familiar than I am, it seemed to me that it was around about 81 that I, I thought you'd be saying that uh, the UT goes wrong, because a lot of the UT's reasoning in this case seems to be based on the approach in 81 of Shiling in the upper tribunal. Um, because that's where you see a concentration on subjective belief evidence, which you say we don't need in this case. I don't think Shiling, Shiling did go wrong um, in that case. because No, but, but then don't we need to draw out what's the difference between Shiling and your case? And isn't it, I mean, I, I, it's just a question for you, but I've puzzled myself a little bit about it. Isn't it somewhere around paragraphs 80 and 81 that in Shi Shiling or Shiling, you had, as I understand it, a JR that had been issued, but was sitting behind a whole lot of other JRs. So nobody had said whether it should get permission or anything. It no nothing had happened with it at all. And what the upper tribunal was really bothered about was the idea that the FTT should, in those circumstances, on a reasonable excuse application, be trying to evaluate the merits of a JR which was sitting in a queue somewhere. And so that's why they then look at this other sort of evidence that you can think about, in other words, whether the taxpayer genuinely believed they thought they had a good case, and you know, you go down that route. And I uh, uh, it just struck me that this was a very different sort of case because here you'd say, well, we don't need to bother with any of that because we've got people telling us, yeah. judges saying what they think of this case. So my lady um, is is exactly right. I mean, the difference the, there are a lot of differences. One, this is an APN, mm. um, where the whole point is getting it paid. Um, Two, Mr. Sheeling Shiling um, was advancing um, a reasonable excuse based on belief. Um, again, his um, interim, the, the judicial reviews in connection with which interim reliefs were given were given on the basis that there would be penalties for non payment. It, it's not clear whether, so th there was a, this ball of judicial reviews on this issue. Some people got interim relief and other people did not, depending on hardship. It's not clear in, um, in um, Sheeling whether he was one that did or did not get interim relief. I'm assuming he did not, because it's not pleaded or argued that the interim relief was relevant. But as we know from um, Chapman, it would have been irrelevant even if it had been in play. Um, so in this case, they had to explore his belief mm. for all of the reasons that my lady has just outlined, much more ably than I did. I don't know. Well, no, that's right. right. But, it, but you dispute some of this, don't you? Because you might say that 81 sub, sub 1 is, was fine on the facts in that case, but it's not fine as a general proposition to say that the FTT, in line with Perrin, should consider all the surrounding facts and circumstances, including the foundation for the taxpayer's belief. As you say, there are some cases where that doesn't really matter. This is one of them. I'm only trying to... So I would generously read um, this as saying, in the context of this case, including the taxpayer's belief, because the reasonable excuse is made yeah. out on the basis of a belief. So I, don't, I wouldn't say that that was a general proposition at all. I think that's a summary of how to apply Perrin in this, this case. Sort of case yeah. Because they've just accepted that Perrin and, and Perrin said we're relevant. Mm -hmm. That relevance doesn't apply here, so they didn't need to put we're relevant in. Mm -hmm. And then, with some trepidation, I get to Beaver. The role of subjective evidence was considered in this court's judgment in Beaver, in which my lady Singer gave judgment. This was a, um, another APN category case, although strictly concerned PPNs. Mr. Beadle exercised his right to make representations against the PPN, and they were rejected such that the PPNs were confirmed. So we had a crystallized tax liability. 
or payment on account liability. Mr. Beadle did not challenge the PPN by way of judicial relief, review. He just simply didn't pay it. When penalised for non-payment, Mr. Beadle appealed the penalty on the grounds that the PPN was a nullity. So he was trying to use the tribunal process to do something that was only, could only actually be done by way of judicial review. The FTT concluded that it had no jurisdiction to consider the validity of the PPN. Mr. Beadle also contended that he had a reasonable excuse for non-payment, and the reasonable excuse was his belief about the unlawful calculation of the PPN liability. The FTT rejected the reasonable excuse appeal on the basis that whatever Mr. Beadle believed to be the case regarding the lawfulness of the PPN, applying the objective standard of a reasonable taxpayer in Mr. Beadle's position, such a reasonable taxpayer would have made payment on the PPN. So the FTT said, I'm not interested in what you think, because if I step back and look objectively, whatever you think is irrelevant, because nobody in your position could reasonably have thought that. The UT upheld the FTT, and then this court reflected over paragraphs 47 to 52, which are at page 396. On the statutory purpose of PPNs in the context of a general presumption that individuals will be given a fair right of challenge of impugned administrative acts. In the context of PPNs, the right of challenge was by way of judicial review, and not through a challenge in connection with enforcement proceedings. It was noted that the very purpose of a PPN would be subverted if it was possible to challenge validity through enforcement proceedings. By reference to this analysis, Mr. Beadle had failed to show, to follow the appropriate route to challenge a PPN. At paragraph 61 on page 399, and by reference to the judgment of Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang in Dunn, the court acknowledges that where a taxpayer has followed the only permissible means of challenge to a PPN, it would be for the FTT to determine whether doing so, or more precisely, not paying while doing so, represented a reasonable excuse. But I re-emphasize Mr. Beadle had not brought a judicial review claim. And in any event, a reasonable taxpayer conscious of and intending to comply with their tax obligations would, in the view of the FTT, the UT, and the Court of Appeal, have paid the PPN. In upholding the FTT and the section quoted from paragraphs 203 in the judgment quoted earlier, the court reinforced that, in that case, subjective evidence was irrelevant because, objectively, he hadn't made out his case. If, objectively, such a belief was reasonable, he would have needed to prove the belief. But if, objectively, it's not, then you don't need evidence of the subjective belief. If I may, I'll deal with exclusive in reply. I will say it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't say anything that the other cases, Shannon, Hayman, Beadle, and Chapman, doesn't say it doesn't have anything. It was added perfectly justifiably by Mr. Ghosh to the clear authorities list. But if I can reply to it, if I know there's anything to reply to. Yeah. So, the test for reasonable excuse, it does what it says on the tin. As identified in step two, defense applies to relieve the imposition of fixed amount penalties in situations in which, adopting the language from 
path, a taxpayer's conduct reflects that which would be expected of a responsible taxpayer conscious of and intending to comply with their tax obligations, in the same position as the actual taxpayer whose conduct is being examined. In the language adopted by the Upper Tribunal in Keeling, a responsible and reasonable taxpayer. Whether there is um, a reasonable excuse is an evaluative exercise. The evaluation takes place by reference to all of the relevant circumstances, including the legislative context in which the penalty or surcharge is applied. If you, if you want us to make a note, you need to go a little slower. So the evaluative, um, you said it's an evaluative exercise, and then you said the evaluation must take account, and that's where I lost you. Um, of all relevant circumstances, which may include the legislative context in which the penalty or surcharge applies. So we saw that happening in um, Steptoe, where the if you're in the if you're in the cash accounting scheme, the penalty applies in one way or potentially a different way. If you're in the standard accounting scheme, in APN scheme, you've got um, the APN's purpose is to trigger a liability to pay. Here, we were in normal world. We were looking at defective closure notices, or on the face of it, defective closure notices. An excuse must be asserted by a taxpayer, and then its reasonableness is asset, uh, objectively assessed by the tribunal or Reasonable excuses are very various and numerous. As identified in Perrin, they may include beliefs, acts, omissions, and a whole range of other things. The task of the fact-finding tribunal will be to establish whether the facts of the excuse are made out, then decide objectively whether other taxpayers in the same situation with the same attributes and experience as the taxpayer and alive to their obligations were also likely to have defaulted or acted in the same way. The bar to establishing a reasonable excuse is not a high one. The excuse does not have to be compelling, just reasonable for the taxpayer in the circumstances in which they found themselves. As referenced in the, the Pelican's Fellow Salesman, the dog ate my homework is not a reasonable excuse, but you didn't give me any homework to do, would be. As an analogy, non-payment of the tax whilst contesting the legitimacy of a tax charge is usual and expected in income tax and capital gains tax disputes. Save in the situations covered oh, hold by... Oh, you're going very fast again. Non-payment of tax while litigating the legitimacy of the tax assessment... Is usual. Is usual. Yeah. Save in the situations covered by section 55HC and HD, which is a ground three point. Um, it is usual for tax not to be paid where <coughs> it is considered that there are reasonable grounds for saying that it's been overcharged. The effect of postponement in the FTT is that the tax is not treated as presently The effect of postponement in an FTT appeal, um, sorry, if there's postponement, then no late penalty, payment penalty or surcharge will apply. But you weren't in these. This is your hypothetical point, is it? So this, this is you an analogy. You, you say you couldn't go to the FTT. And, the and therefore these provisions could not apply. That, that's correct. But 
what we're saying is that when assessing the reasonableness of um, non-payment, it's appropriate to look at other situations in which tax is being contested and whether in those situations tax would be paid. And the, by far the more normal situation is you get an income tax or capital gains tax um, assessment, it is challenged on the basis that it, is, it overcharges tax, a request for postponement is made, and generally speaking, it's postponed. So outside an APN situation, most income and um, capital gains tax appeals are done without payment of the tax. As far as the FTT, if you lose in the FTT, then under the statutory scheme, well, postponement ends under the statutory scheme. Might. Because under section 55.9, mm. tax does not become due, what, sorry, tax does not become payable until 30 days after HMRC issues a request for payment. So my lady, you are right that if HMRC issue that request for payment, then an obligation to pay arises. Okay, so you say they may they may choose not to. They may choose not to. If, if the they case don't, is going actually, they are entitled mm. to. And we see exactly the same in section fifty six. Whereas, if you go on an appeal, and the court, the, the upper tribunal, then determines that more tax is due, then again you've got the same thirty day request for payment. So it's not the issue of the tribunal decision which re-triggers yeah. the liability to pay. There is a physical, actual production of a document that says we now want the money and it's due um, 30 days after the issue of that document. Did you refer to section 56? Then? 50, so 55.9 yes. and 56. Okay. Three. Yeah. 56 three. Have we got those? Yeah. 56 three B. Um, both of those provisions are in the um, authorities bundle. Yeah. Um, 55 is at tab five, and 56 is at um, tab six. Yes, thank you. Okay. Does that apply? Do does section 56 look like it applies to all further appeals? It could be this court. Yes. Okay. It, so it applies. 56.3b applies. So you won at the FTT, so nothing has become due. HMRC haven't issued, um, can't issue a 30 day payment request. UT or the Court of Appeal find something different, such that, um, or increases the assessment. Um, mm. then that increased assessment becomes payable only once a 30-day request for payment. Okay. I'm, not sh okay, I'm not sure we should get into this debate because I'm not sure it's quite that straightforward looking at section 56, but, but subsection 2. But, um, so I can, if I yeah. deal briefly with yeah. that, the liability is... So tax is payable or repayable in accordance with in accordance with the decision. But if you go back to fifty five nine, on the determination by the appeal, this is horribly complicated um, provision, but it's quite clear that on the determination of the appeal. HMRC must issue this re requirement. In agreement. other words, there's a difference between tax being payable and tax being due, or not? Well, 56.2 says it's payable or repayable in accordance with the determination. But our contention is that 
56 2 is not the mechanism by reference to which the tax is ultimately the tax debt is set it's by reference to the notice of payment under 55 9 so it is in accordance with it but the debt is not crystallized by the judgment because otherwise there would be a conflict between 55 9 yeah. and 56 okay two. submission that I noted just now was that non-payment of tax whilst contesting the validity of a tax charge of one sort or another is um, non-payment is expected in the usual course. Um, is that because across all different types of tax there are measures in place to enable taxpayers to ask a tribunal to let them not pay the tax while the thing is going on? In other words, do they have to make out their case across all these sorts of different taxes or are there alternative so 55, mm. so I don't want to talk about taxes generally because indirect taxes are different. Okay. There is a prima facie liability to pay unless you can establish hardship. Okay, so it's a hardship. So, that's what so we're in, focusing on direct tax for yes, the purposes that's of my lady's question. Okay, I was just making clear that I was yeah. that we were focused. So yeah. In, yeah. In, in connection with direct yes. taxes, the postponement provision is 55.3, and it's if the appellant has grounds for believing that an assessment or amendment, amendment or assessment, sorry, overcharges the appellant, or as a result of a conclusion stated in the closure notice, the tax charged on the appellant is excessive, excessive the appellant may first apply to HMRC and then second apply to the tribunal. So HMRC have a discretion in those circumstances to postpone, and, then, and if they refuse, you can go to the tax tribunal and ask them to postpone. That's you, right. and, and you said that, that there's a, a general expectation that you don't have to pay. Most people, uh, try not to give evidence, if you're challenging a tax, a, a tax assessment or conclusion is because you don't believe that amounts to you. So unless you're bringing an abusive appeal, which would be struck out for want of jurisdiction because it's got no reasonable prospect of success, the very fact that you can bring an appeal with a reasonable prospect of success is the same as that it's, it's reasonable that, it's been over, that you've been overcharged. So if you're challenging um, a charge to tax on the basis that on a basis that's acceptable to the FTT under Rule 8, it would meet the test under Rule 55.3. But what is the test? Is it just an open discretion? Or is it a reasonableness or hardship? Or is there a threshold that needs to be met? Reasonable, it, on the basis it's been reasonably overcharged. Reasonable grounds for believing it's been overcharged. So it's reasonable grounds for believing. Okay. Has, has grounds That's the for test. believing. The grounds Grounds. grounds for believing. Yes. And so um, the submission is that um, any cogent grounds for believing, so obviously not something, so not where it's a, um, obviously hopeless, but if there is a proper case about grounds for believing and an overcharge, the normal course is that the taxpayer is not required to pay up front. Is that right? Yes. And that's the operation of 55.3. 55.3, particularly in combination with Rule 8 of the Tribunal Rules, which is it shouldn't admit a case and HMRC will challenge it if there are no reasonable prospects of success. So yeah, yeah. you've got a reasonable prospect of success, therefore it would be surprising if you didn't have a reasonable ground for believing that it overcharged you. They're effectively synonymous with one another. And if 
I hesitate slightly to pull the analogy any further. But the analogy, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis section 56, is that for Mr Archer, Mr Justice Jay determined that there was no enforceable debt. So he said that the judicial review proceedings <coughs> were in use, but he determined there was no enforceable debt. So if you're looking at analogy, we won at the first stage on whether there was a debt or not. So when you went to the upper tribunal, the Court of Appeal, we were in a situation of a win on the enforceable debt question. So 56.3 came into play at best only after the Court of Appeal judgment, not after Mr Justice Jay did. Well, it's all by analogy, yes. of course, yes. because yes. Section 56, we weren't <laughs> going through the tribunal route. Mr no. Justice Jay was in the admin. Uh, and he said, he, and he, he refused interim relief, having refused, to, having dismissed the judicial review. He did, and eight days later, saw Justice Jay. Yes. And so yes, but... We weren't in the tribunal. No, we, we weren't. And it, it, it's merely, when we're looking at all of the circumstances, we apply this only as it's not abhorrent that people run challenges to tax liability in situations in which they don't pay and they don't get penalised for not paying. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. And and the, the way that works is it, the tax... If it is effectively postponed, it's treated as not payable for the purposes of surcharge and penalties. Is that right? It would still accrue interest, wouldn't it? It would still accrue okay. interest. And Mr Archer has paid his interest. Yes. At the heart of the reasonably excused defence is an evaluation of whether the conduct of the particular taxpayer falls within a range of conduct to be expected of reasonably taxpayers. If the answer is yes, it falls within that range, reasonable excuse is made out. The subjective evidence of the state of mind of a taxpayer will, I accept, in many cases um, be relevant and in many cases not relevant. Where the reasonably excuse relied on is a belief, then state of mind will, of course, be relevant. But as we know from Beadle, even a genuinely held belief may not represent a reasonable excuse. It's all about what is objectively reasonable. Belief is a feature of all of the APN cases. And that's why they look at belief. Mr Archer's reasonable excuse was not based on belief. It was based only on the objective conclusions of the courts through which he had litigated the debt question. And HMRC's response in terms of requiring as a consequence of interim relief and what they said on his statement of account and on his view, which I will come to shortly. So, what's wrong with the Upper Tribunal's decision? The Upper Tribunal determined that there was an error of law which vitiated the FCT judgment and which necessitated to remake the decision on whether a reasonable excuse had been made out. However, the UT rejected my ground two challenge that the FTT had failed to properly apply Perrin in this case. The UT notes that the issues identified in respect of ground two were then relevant when they remade their decision. So it's necessary to consider and evaluate the ground two analysis as well as the, um, the remake 
paragraphs 118 to 130, um, which start on page 105 of the full bundle, tab 7. The UT summarises the judgments in Perrin, Beadle and Sheely. The submissions made on behalf of Mr Archer um, are set out at paragraphs 131 to 136. These arguments are not then actually specifically addressed. Rather, at 140, the upper tribunal expressed the view that the propositions advanced by Mr Ripley on behalf of HMRC meet the objections raised on behalf of Mr Archer. As set out at 140, this is on page 110 of the full bundle, HMRC contended that in order to succeed, Mr Archer was required to establish that the reasonable excuse advanced had caused the non-payment, and that without an evidenced subjective good belief as to the strength of his case, there was no excuse to objectively so the UT accepted that proposition as meeting mine. The UT amplified on the question of causation at 141, quoting from Steptoe, to justify an approach which seeks to establish the underlying cause of default. But as I've already said, the quotation used by the UT doesn't reflect the real substance of the conclusions in Stepto. In Stepto, the court was looking to fairly assess whether the taxpayer had acted in a manner to be expected of a conscientious taxpayer in all of the circumstances, even when the presenting reason for default was on its face and unallowable. Well, looking behind the insuffic insufficiency of funds ensured that the taxpayer who found themselves in a position of default through no fault of his own was not, um, did not justify a penalty. At paragraph 42, the upper tribunal recites paragraph 85 of Schuling and the predominant reason test. 86. 85. No. Paragraph 142 are you on? 142, sorry. It is, it's 86 of, of Schuling. 143 accepts by reference to that paragraph and the similar approach adopted in Chapman that the reason or excuse put forward must have caused the non-payment. At 144, the UT concludes that the need to establish causation inevitably means that there must be evidence of subjective belief. We would say somewhat incredibly the upper tribunal goes on to state, no matter how strong the argument on invalidity, the real reason for non-payment may be an inability to pay. At 145, the UT indicates that even absent any evidence of insufficiency, a sufficiency of funds must be proven, indicating that to require otherwise permits the taxpayer to take a view that he will not disclose any details of his own personal circumstances. If the upper tribunal were right, that would require that in every single reasonable excuse case where the statute provides um, for the equivalent of the insufficiency or inability to pay exclusion, that the tribunal would have to be, it would have to be proven that there was a sufficiency of um, the payment. So in effect, the upper tribunal has created a presumption of insufficiency, save where a sufficiency is proven, and that reasonable excuse relies on that presumption. That is stark. It has no basis in statute, and it's contrary to previous authorities, such as Stepto and Perrin, which leaves it to the tribunal or court to determine the reasonableness 
of the taxpayer's conduct in a particular case. It's also inappropriate in the present case. We say there was evidence, certainly at the start and at the end, that Mr. Archer had the money. Despite Judge Hellier at 49 below me indicating that um, something to be an ex reasonable excuse, it must be absent that um, excuse, we know, as I've already said, that he went on to consider the third reason, despite the fact that the second reason, if, if, if insufficiency is a knockout blow, it's a knockout blow. It doesn't sometimes be a knockout round and not other. And we so also see in Perrin. Sorry, if you were otherwise moving on from 145, can I just ask, at the end of 145, um, the upper tribunal decision, it says Ms. Brown was not seeking to draw any inference as to what Mr. Archer believed as to the need for him to pay the tax. Um, I just wanted to clarify what, well, whether you agreed with that, whether you're seeking to adopt in any sense a different position on that in this court? No. Um, no, you do agree, but I'm not adopt. <laughs> <laughs> I am not seeking to draw an inference as to what Mr Archer believed. We say that his reasonable excuse is that Objectively, on the basis of the evidence I'll come to, a reasonable taxpayer in his circumstances would not have paid. Okay, but do you, does your case involve an inference as to the reason? I'm not talking about belief as to you know, what he thought, but does your case involve an inference that uh, it was the uh, JR proceedings that provided I'm going to use the word reason or cause I mean, it comes back to what we were discussing earlier but I'm still a little little bit unclear about your case on that going, going back to my roadblock example mm. I don't invite you that it was a roadblock. I invite you to conclude that it was obviously a roadblock. As a matter of law, it was a roadblock. So there's, it's the, I'm niggled by the inference bit. Mm. Your roadblock point goes, I mean, you've got a number of points, but that goes to the rendering the proceedings nugatory or at least potentially so. That's your roadblock that you're focusing on, as I understand it. Yeah. And, and if you if you cannot pay um, because of the course of action that you are following, and you know, there's no he was following that course of action. Mm. <laughs> Um, that's fact. We know, as we'll come to, what the court said about that course of action. That course of action. So, it might be that you use the word inference, and I hear something different from what you mean um, by that. Well, I suppose I'm. I'm. There's a. If if you think it's necessary to show that you don't only possess something that someone may regard as a reasonable excuse, but that was what resulted, caused, was the reason for you not paying. If that's required, then do you need a bit of inference just to get from A to B, if you like? You, I, I know you're going to say it's blindingly obvious, but I'm just trying to understand your case. I'm going to say yes. You do need a bit of evidence. That no, no, if, it's not, if it's not blindingly obvious, I may need a bit of inference. But I say that it is blindingly 
You put it in a few ways. Um, I think when I asked you this earlier, you said, and you've just said it again now, that you see it as, as an issue of law, that as a matter of law, you've got a day R extant, and that, that creates a legal roadblock, in effect, to you paying the tax. But if that's not right, you say, as a matter of fact, it's blindingly obvious and doesn't need anything else. And if that's not right, if it's not blindingly obvious, then the inference would fill the gap because there isn't anything else put here. Do I have that right? You put it in those different ways. Um, can I just take this a bit further on? If, if that is how you put it, so let's just call that the, sort of the roadblock point. That would operate, wouldn't it, in any case where any taxpayer takes a JR alongside a tax demand and, and questions the procedural validity of the JR. You would say there's, in all those cases, there is a, a roadblock to paying the tax. The issue then becomes on the reasonable excuse ana um, analysis, whether it was effectively um, whether it was reasonable for that taxpayer not to have paid or to have taken the JR in those circumstances. So it, you know, that all depends on whether you've got permission or interim relief, or whether it's a, you know a subjective reasonable belief that you've been advised. You then get into the sort of fact bucket at that stage. Is that right? Yes, and and I think the critical difference between this case and many of the others is that it, certainly if you look at the APN case. The penalty appeals were happening without the benefit of knowing the outcome of the judicial review. Yeah. So you didn't, in those cases, you didn't have the benefit of what was found to be. You know, and that's but that's that's rather that's what I've called the fact bucket, which may not be a very happy way of explaining it, but. You, it, it then all depends at that point. But the principle, I, I think what you're saying, I mean, if you're right on this point, I think it applies in any case where you take a JR, doesn't it? Because you'd always have this roadblock argument um, in principle, but the FTT would then have to ask itself, well, was there really a roadblock? Was it reasonable to have taken mm. the JR or to have not to have paid the tax in the circumstances? Yes. And that could have been the position here because the revenue could have said, let's proceed with the... The revenue agreed to, to halt the, the surcharge appeal, didn't they, pending the outcome of the JR. But they could have proceeded with it and then you'd have been into beliefs, wouldn't you? Yes. yes so, would, so it's a question of timing. Yes. Oh, hold on a minute. You but, that, but that this, doesn't... Is that right? Um, I, I thought we got to your case that you go off on, on a left-hand track saying, but I had got judges saying that you can have permission or you can have interim relief, I'm going to grant permission for an appeal. You've got, you've got objective evidence in the form of judicial Only statements. because of the timing bit. Because yes, that went ahead first. Whereas it could have been the case, like in the PPN cases, or or APN you get cases permission. that you'd go ahead with the, with the surcharge appeal and then you're into beliefs. Yes, that would be right. Sorry, yes, that would be absolutely right. So but here, here, you went one way, not other. That, that, that's exactly right. I agree with um, Lady, Lady, Lady Justice Simler's. It is a timing question. But that doesn't, there's nothing offensive about it being a timing question because the reasonable excuse advanced would have had to have been something different because we couldn't, we wouldn't have had the evidence on which we currently rely. So, well, you'd have had to say, I've been advised by David Goldberg, KC, that I've got a very good case, that my closure notice doesn't amount to an assessment. That's and, right. And no debt has created. Yes. That's right. But we're not in that position. Yes, it might be a quirk of circumstance or simply timing. But we don't have to say, I believed I had a really strong case. Because we can say, look at what Mr. Justice Carr said, look at what Mr. Justice First of all, now Lady Justice Whipple, then Mrs. Justice Jay, then the Court of Appeal, and then HMRC's solicitor. Um, and then you put all of that in the broader context as well of the collection suspended and nothing to pay. Um, but it's this reasonable excuse which is being assessed, not some hypothecated alternative reasonable excuse that might have been 
or might have had to have been run in a different situation. So just finishing the point around um, presumption of insufficiency. As I've already said, there are some um, surcharges or penalties that say that there is an alternative um, prohibition on reasonable disputes, which is reliance on a third party. And those cases say that exactly the same as insufficiency of funds, it's not the fact of sometimes we have to look at then whether the third party had a reason to keep it themselves. But what we see in peril is there's no apparent consideration by the by the FTT or the UT of whether Mrs. Perrin did or did not rely on a third party. There was no evidence that she did. Um, so the tribunal didn't look and say, when well, we've, we've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that she didn't rely on a third party and that it was actually reliance on a third party that caused her to stop. You know, what if she'd phoned a friend and said, I've got this, is that enough? Well, she could have done that, but she didn't say she'd done that. So the tribunal didn't look at it, whereas on the hypothecated test that, um, or on the basis of the test that the tribunal puts here, there would be a presumption of reliance on a third party unless you prove that there wasn't, in the same way as there's a presumption of insufficiency here, unless you prove that you've, that you've got sufficient funds or an ability to pay. What Perrin and Chapman did was just view the evidence objectively. In Sheeling, the taxpayer had advanced as part of its defence um, that the insufficiency of funds was beyond its control. So the tribunal did need to consider that, and it determined that it had two, um, and that overrode in any event. There is a juxtaposition between the approach of the FTT in Chapman and the UT in Sheeling as to whether a case advanced in part on the explanation for an accepted insufficiency of funds warrants an investigation into the dominant reason. But neither case, we say, purports, supports a conclusion that in another case where in insufficiency or inability to pay is not advanced, that you've got to establish whether it was the prison predominant reason. So you say we've got no case law that really covers that question of weighing reasons. We've got we've got no case law that expressly covers it. Agreed. By implication, all of the case law implies that you only need to do it where an impermissible, as in statutory impermissible, route is Yes, I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not sure there's a clearly a, um, a if there is a statutory impermissible reason, then then that's fine. But there can be reasons that aren't prohibited by statute that are still clearly never going to be reasonable. You gave the dog ate my homework example. I'm not sure there. There's a qualitative difference. Neither will do. I agree, but it still comes back to what is the reasonable excuse that's advanced? Otherwise, we would have just a Harry Carry of evidence. No, of course. Just linking it to the sort of causation point, and an example I thought of was um, illness of a close relative, serious illness of a close relative. Now that might well be put forward as a reasonable excuse, uh, and the position might vary enormously between some taxpayers. Some taxpayers might be using that as an excuse when it didn't really, didn't really make a difference. Um, Whereas others, it really did make a difference. And that, that takes you back to that sort of causation point. 
that we've been debating. You can see that if I have a seriously ill close relative and it really impacts on my ability to put in my return time meal on a timely basis or whatever it is, um, that is one thing, but not if you know, I haven't seen them for a year anyway. But that's merely testing the quality of the evidence in relation to that reasonable excuse, or, or that advanced excuse. That's not testing some other possible reason. It's just testing that. If I had a sick relative, so I didn't put my return mm -hmm. in, of course you test whether that's proven. That's what Perrin tells you to do. But I'm sorry if I'm not following my lady's question. No, it, 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 it's one thing to prove that you've got a sick relative. It's another to say how it impacts on your ability to file your return. Or that, That's my point. But I would say that that is a proper assessment of all of the circumstances in relation to that reasonable excuse. Okay. And I am not shying away from it was right, and if I am right that the tribunal has gone wrong, this court is going to have to do it. You should shape the reasonable excuse. And you but not just the reasonable excuse, the extent to which it caused the position leading to default. The reasonable excuse defence. Yes, mm -hmm. so what was it the, a reasonable excuse and did it cause the default? Was it a reasonable excuse? And in all the circumstances, would a, um, a reasonable taxpayer conscientious of his um, taxing obligations, etc., etc., have done the same thing? Well, why? why? Why isn't it? Did it cause the default in this case? Was it the reason in so, this case? And then you stand back and you say, objectively, was that all reasonable? Well, what Perrin says on this is, is fundamentally the same task. It's an ob objective assessment of cause. I thought your three levels um, was, was your answer on causation. Did you say that, this, that causation is established? In other words, the, the reason put forward is the, the reason yes. why the tax wasn't paid. In this case, either because the law says that, that's, that, that night follows day, or because it's blindingly obvious, or because we should draw the inference. Yes. I thought we'd gone over that. We have. And I apologise if I said something that No, no. I just wanted to tie it all up. That does tie up. I mean, I've got, we've, I've understood the case, have I? Yes. Thank you. So I'm having my gown tugged. <laughs> um, the the defence is a reasonable excuse. Excuse must imply some element of causation, and of course the cases have indicated that there needs to be some element of causation. But it is an objective test. So if that excuse would have, or that explanation, if I can use a neutral term, that explanation was a cause, then it is sufficient to be a reasonable excuse. The predominant cause thing is associated with, um, particularly with, the statutory prohibitions. So if it was a cause, that's enough. You don't need to show that it was the cause. Objectively. 
if that explanation was objectively a cause, a cause. that's enough. Because whilst that's there and you've got a reason to not pay, you're not going to pay. So we say that the UT was wrong in law for concluding that a sufficiency of funds must be proven at all and that the only way um, of Mr. Archer proving that he didn't have an impermissible reason which predominated was by way of oral evidence. At 46 to 49, the UT goes on to consider that determines not to decide whether the reason the judicial review proceedings would have rendered um, Mr. Rendered proceedings nugatory had he made payment. The UT reasons that absent evidence from Mr Archer as to his reasons for non-payment, there's simply no evidence on which to assess whether there was a reasonable excuse at all. However, the objective evaluation of Mr Archer's conduct and the fact of non-payment requires an assessment of this question as recognised by the order granting permission. The question is whether or not the judicial review proceedings would be rendered nugatory by payment, or more relevantly, whether there was a risk that, um, the with the associated risk, that Mr. Archer would be left with no legal remedy, even in the event that he was right that there was no enforceable debt. At 150, the UT rejects reliance on the evidence of the closure notices themselves. Although um, the tribunal recorded my submission by reference to Mr. Justin Piet's gaping hole, um, it doesn't then address why that gaping hole was not enough. Actually, as we'll see, Mr. Justice Jay referred to it as a categorical error with existential consequences, not just a gaping hole. I would hope that this court finds that quite disturbing, that the tribunal ignored that. This is a case where, through no fault of Mr. Archer's, HMRC made a clear, obvious, and gross, or worse, error in two closure notices. An error one would have thought substantially more serious than a misplaced decimal point. They were lacking, the closure notices were lacking the central and essential feature of setting out any amendments made to the self assessment and any amount of tax payable as a consequence. As we will see, um, this court's judgment in the JR later explains why those things are essential as part. That obvious area in the closure notices um, had also been sufficient to cause the admin court to take the relatively unusual step of granting interim relief in an urgent out-of-hours hearing on the same day the claim for was issued. Well, hold on, that was to do with bankruptcy proceedings. The means of enforcing a payment. Um, and as if, our if there hadn't been the imminent threat of bankruptcy proceedings, there wouldn't have been urgent interim relief given, and it may be that the surcharge appeal would have been litigated first. But none of those things happened. No. But it's, yeah, okay. As we'll see, um, we, as the court is well aware, Mr. Justice Henderson said that it would be wrong in principle to allow collection through bankruptcy proceedings in light of Mr. Justice Jay's judgment that there was no debt. The basis on which the UT rejected ground two 
however, led directly into the basis on which it remade the decision. The UT founded its decision at 167 on the absence of evidence directly from Mr Archer as to the subjective reason for non-payment. The UT considered that if Mr Archer could establish without subjective evidence that there were reasonable grounds for prosecuting the judicial review, they say, with some encouragement from the court, we would say there's quite a lot of encouragement from the court, um, then there were evidential gaps in the period between the High Court and the Court of Appeal Commission, which was 14 days, and following the Court of Appeal judgment, we would say until the agreement with HMRC was reached, which was akin to Parisian relief. It's noted that Mr Archer had more than a reasonable, argue, reasonably arguable case for the reasons that I'll take you to shortly. That aside, the UT considered the only way in which the perceived evidential gaps could be filled was through oral evidence. That's at 168. The UT erred in law in this micro-focus on the perceived need for oral evidence. At 169, the UT expressed the view that it's extremely unlikely that a reasonable taxpayer would have continued to withhold the tax in light of Mr Justice Jay's judgment and order. But that's an extraordinary conclusion when we know only a few days later Lord Henderson interpreted the same judgment as saying that there was no death and it would be wrong in principle to allow HMRC to continue their proposed enforcement action. Mr Justice Jay's decision to decline the grant um, to grant judicial review remedy was on the basis that he considered that there ought to be um, ought to have been an FTT appeal. But he also acknowledged himself that on the section one four sorry one one four issue in the FTT, bearing in mind he found in Mr Archer's favour in connection with the closure notice, but in relation to other proceedings which he said were the FTT proceedings, he described that issue as the most difficult issue in the case. Why would a reasonable taxpayer pay an amount to HMRC when a High Court judge had just stated in his reasoned opinion that there was no debt and no assessment in all instance? I don't dispute that it was reasonable for a taxpayer to do something because we were in limbo land. He'd said there was no debt but that there was, um, that because Mr Archer had taken the wrong um, route, that he couldn't challenge that debt. But the something he had to do was seek permission from the Court of Appeal and renew the interim relief application. That's what he did. And Lord Justice Henderson said he was right to do so. It, making an application which fails may be reasonable, but making an application which succeeds surely must be reasonable. How could oral evidence of Mr Archer's own beliefs in this case even be relevant when we have the contemporaneous authoritative judicial statements that says that he did the right thing? The UT continued at 171 as regards the second perceived gap after the 30th of November and says it's difficult to see that any reasonable taxpayer would have continued to withhold payment in light of the Court of Appeal judgment. The same points apply. In this case, in this instance, rather than the Supreme Court um, granting interim relief, HMRC solicitor took a decision to do the same thing. It quit. And they did it as a bargain. Please do not expedite these proceedings. And I'll come on to unreasonable delay. It's very difficult to be accused of taking a long time to do something when you've agreed with HMRC that you won't do it the quickest route possible. 
So it's contended that the UT's approach to what a reasonable taxpayer would do was infected by this micro-focus on the absence of subjective evidence. And that's confirmed at 172, which provides a clear indication that the UT had formed a view that only evidence of Mr Archer's subjective beliefs would have enabled him to make good his reasonable excuse. To do so was to fail to address the actual reasonable excuse advanced, which was not based on Mr Archer's subjective beliefs. It had never been, by the time you got to the FTT, it was not Mr Archer's case that his reasonable excuse was founded on his beliefs. My lady, um, Justice Simler, when he put his grounds of appeal in, it was on the basis of belief. Um, and of course, at that time, it was 2016. Mm. Yep. So, the so case. Had it gone on at that point? Then we would have been, would in, have a been in this. Yes, that still slightly troubles me, but I'll get there in the end. Hopefully, I won't trouble you. So, was the appeal stayed pending the JR? Yes, the revenue agreed. Well, no, I, I thought the revenue agreed. Sorry, I've, mis I've missed a stitch. I thought the revenue agreed at a later stage. No, they agreed. Right not, at the outset. I think it's they agreed at the outset not to pursue the to put the surcharge appeal on hold. Yeah, I'd have to check back. I when don't the, think sorry, the yes. appeal was lodged. Was notified to the tribunal. So I don't know. You need to notify. You need to make your appeal to HMRC. I think it went on hold at that stage. I see. So the. FTT references are almost certainly, I think, later. much later yeah. because they were notified, but HMRC said, we agree, yeah. let's do nothing yeah. for now. So you never got anywhere close to evidence or anything like that because at, at the early stages it was just on ice while the JR went through. Yeah. What you felt was the sufficiency. You notified the revenue of your grounds. Yeah. You, you sent them the grounds and the revenue said, we, we think that we should put this on hold and you agree I think there was an email that KPMG agreed that's correct um, so moving swiftly on I hope to, to um, Mr Archer's reasonable excuse as I've said it's, it's got three planks we say each one of them is capable on its own but definitely taken together um, they form a reasonable excuse the first is um, that um, he had a strong prime facie case that there was no debt, that there was no objective expectation that payment would be made, and that payment would have rendered the proceedings in the judicial review nugatory or a pyrrhic victory. So, strong prime facie case. Um, here, the question is, did Mr Archer have an objectively justified basis to begin the judicial review without making payment of the disputed sum? Um, at the heart of this question is whether a reasonable taxpayer would have challenged whether there was an enforceable debt. It's relevant to note here that the FTT recorded at paragraph 109, which is 4 bundle tab 12, 177, It can't be 177 because it ends at 157. Absolutely. What was it, 109? Yeah. I think it's 152, but the numbering is a bit blurry on mine. Yes, I think it's page 152. Can't be. The FTT notes at 109 that the review officer, HMRC's review officer, said that taking the... Um, Judicial review was a reasonable position to take. Yeah. The by way of a brief reminder, and please tell me if you don't need this reminder, Section twenty eight A provides for the completion of HMRC's inquiries into the tax return. Twenty eight A one provides for the closure notice to state conclusions and twenty eight for there to be an amendment or a statement that 
Section 59D and paragraph 5 of Schedule 3ZA um, set the um, date due for payment as 30 days after the closure notice. Yep. Mr Archer received closure notices which are at supplementary bundle um, 1 and 2. They're both identical. And I would just invite the court to look at those and it is quite plain that there is no assessment in place. It's not arguable or debatable. Yeah. Well, that, that's been determined. Yes. Well, we can take that as read. They were not, as would have been expected. And that was confirmed um, by Mr Justice. J, um, in paragraphs 37 and 70 of his judgment. I mean, do, we, do we take into account the section 114 curative provision when we are thinking about the extent to which this was an objectively justified judicial review? I, mean, I, I, I noted that in the course of his oral submissions to Mr Justice Carr, um, Mr Archer's uh, silk uh, acknowledged that this could be viewed as a purely technical case and that the revenue would likely say uh, that they could put it right, um, which may well have been a reference to section 114. So the answer to my lady's question is that you're standing in the shoes of a obviously advised by Peter Bradley, very well advised um, taxpayer who has received these closure notices. But apart from Through this technical omission, the tax there was no dispute that the tax was due. There was no challenge to the substantive validity of the online liability. of the liability. Yes. So, no. so when you are looking at uh, the reasonableness of pursuing a judicial review based on that omission, do you factor in the likelihood of Section One One Four coming to the <coughs> rescue of the revenue collecting body? Well, you certainly, it is one of the relevant circumstances, yes. Um, and it was factored in by Mr Justice Carr, who granted the order anyway. So well, it goes yes, back... he said, it, even if in the end it may not be a good point. Yes, he did. He said, at this stage, uh, ex parte without notice, I'm giving you the interim relief you are seeking. He did. Um, I'll come come on when we look at Justice Mr Justice Jay's judgment that he thought it didn't apply. So we had it might, it doesn't, it does. Um, on on one one four. Yes, I confess to having found it very difficult to understand Mr Justice Jay's reasoning on that. There it is. Clarity was so did the court of by Lord Justice. Jason. Um. The hole in the um, in the closure notice was drawn to HMRC's attention within the 30 days. Mr. J, Mr. Justice J says he left it very late. Facts are it was late in the period, but it was done. And HMRC's response was to assert that the self-assessment had been amended. Um, they said that the tax was now due and payable. Um, but HMRC's position is difficult to understand in accordance with the legislation, the closure notice, and their own guidance. Um, they had not sent 
um, tax calculations, and they have not made an amendment. And there was some debate about whether they had or had not sent out um, closure notices, but Mr Justice Jay accepted on the evidence that they had not. Um, correspondence, um, which is in the bundle um, at um, pages 59 and 60, followed, but HMRC stuck to their position and then um, said, we're going to bankrupt Mr Archer. So on the 29th of March, um, Mr Archer commenced judicial review proceedings and um, received his um, first interim order. It's interesting to note that the terms of the order provided only for liberty for HMRC to apply to discharge the order um, and an undertaking for damages. So this interim relief was given at, at and around the same time as the um, interim reliefs in the APN cases, but that, that and HMRC can issue a penalty anyway, was not included. And HMRC, and HMRC weren't there? No, but they had liberty to apply and they never applied. In the, um, whilst there's no formal judgment of Mr Justice Kerr, um, there is a detailed note which the tribunal accepted that paragraph 23 has never been contested by HMRC. And it records that the interim relief application was granted on the basis that there was a deficiency in the closure notice and a strong prima facie case that um, the tax debt did not crystallise until notice is served in its proper form and it has not yet been done on the evidence. That's at page 101 of the, um, of the judgment bit at 101. Yeah. He said, he said that the TMA provisions and the decision in Hallamshire seem to raise a strong prima, prima facie case, even if it may not in the end be a good point. Um, permission to bring the judicial review claim was then granted um, by my lady and lady Justice Whipple on the 21st of September. In accordance with the required approach to applications of that type, my lady must have been satisfied that there remains a strong prima facie case. I think I said it was um, eligible to know. That's the threshold for permission. Threshold for permission is... Oh, yes, and I, I continued the IR. Just now. Sorry, sorry, go on. <laughs> I'm, my lady will only know for herself, but yeah. if you look at factor chain, mm -hmm. um, then, and although factor chain is obviously different, um, this, like factor chain, was a case in which... Um, the government was being stopped from doing that which they would ordinarily be able to do in the collection of tax, and so it should have been a strong prima facie case. Um, according to my watch, it's exactly one o'clock, and I was just about to move on to Mr. Jay's judgment. So thank you. Just as an indication to us, so that we know where we're going, how long um, do you think you need after the short adjournment, Ms. Brown? Um, I'm going to commit to no more than an hour. Well, I'm, we're, we're not going to hold you to it. We, we've got a day and a half, but that sounds that sounds more That's, than enough. I mean, we've all read uh, the the, the uh, decisions of the High Court and the Court of Appeal. In uh, which case, I hopefully I, I do want to make the point. Yes, of course you um, must. And um, and then we can, but hopefully I can take them quite quickly. Um, but I I do expect. It does depend a little bit on the level of intervention. But. Thank you very much. <laughs> Two o'clock then. All right.